blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who stretches out the heavens, who sends light to the nations, who gives breath to us all. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. We invite those who are able to kneel with us in a time of confession and forgiveness. Loving God, we confess that we have turned from your way to follow our own ways. Forgive us for the times we have spoken or acted too quickly. We have not spoken or acted at all. We have hurt those closest to us. We have hurt those we have yet to know. We have thought more about ourselves than others. We have thought less of ourselves than we ought. Turn us around and give us a fresh start so that we can live again as your children. Amen. Even when we have done wrong, God makes us right. Even when we have messed up, God puts us together. God's love never runs out. God never tires of calling us beloved children. Hear God say to you now, your sins are forgiven for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able in body or in spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. today is a prayer for the Sunday of the Epiphany. Please join me as we pray. O oh God, on this day you revealed your Son to the nations by the leading of a star. Lead us now by faith to know your presence in our lives and bring us at last to the full vision of your glory. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
congregation may be seated. A few announcements as we continue this morning. First off, um, a reminder that today, immediately following church, we will be taking down the greens, um, which is a tradition on the Sunday of the Epiphany. So if anyone can stick around and help, that would be much appreciated. Also, church council, Tuesday night, 6 o'clock. Um, a reminder to all newly elected church council members, you are also invited to be present at the that um, meeting as well as we begin to make the transition for February installation. Um, I know it's cold, it snows on the way, we just got done with Christmas but we need to talk about Lent. Um, Ash Wednesday is Valentine's Day so we are about five weeks away from Lent so please begin to put that into your calendars that our soup suppers will return on February 21st um, as we will start our journey of Lent. Also, noisy offering totals are in $2,418.57. Um, not quite sure who won, but well done, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, just, a, just a really cool tradition, and, and uh, I'm not sure who are the bigger kids. Um, the kids pulling the wagons and getting the buckets, um, or y'all making the noise. It's, it's just an awesome experience. So thank you. The kids will gather Wednesday night, correct, Julie? Wednesday night... Um, to begin selecting their global barnyard project. So uh, it, it's an exciting time for us. Um, finally, my last announcement is on two weeks from today, on the 28th, uh, will be the annual meeting. So please make note, three weeks from today, on the 28th, will be the annual meeting. So please make note of that and plan, plan to attend. And with that, our church council president has an announcement. Hey, good morning. Um, last week, those of you who happened to be here, we talked about changes to the endowment committee document. And I'm here to talk about that. Please bear with me if you've already heard this. But um, the, we, uh, we, the deck rush gift is also now, it's now going to be referred to as the legacy fund. And according to the Constitution, the Congregational Council shall be responsible for the financial and property matters of this congregation. The Congregational Council shall be responsible for this congregation's investments and its total insurance program. In order to fulfill all of these directions, the Council has voted and approved new language that places the administration of the Legacy Fund under the umbrella of the Endowment Committee. The newly proposed, proposed language will be voted on at the annual meeting on January 28th that Pastor just announced, thank you, and following this service. Um, we would love to have you please stay for discussion and voting on this pretty important matter. Um, the revised St. Paul Lutheran Endowment Fund document has been emailed to everyone in the congregation so you can look it over and look at the new language and see it, even the old, I had never seen this document until I asked to see it in order for the council to work on this project. We actually started in October working with documents and trying to decide what would be the best way to basically take this fund and really keep it as a legacy for our children and grandchildren. Um, we do have paper copies here available today. They're at the back on the table um, on your way out if you did not or do not get an email. Basically, I have to thank John Besling and Steve Korn. They, um, they met, they revised, they, re they reviewed, and they've retyped this, and they, they have done the majority of the actual um, legal work that comes to this, because this is a legal document. Um, we've also added the Gladys Wall Fund into the endowment umbrella, so there's a couple of other changes. Currently, the endowment I'm sorry, the legacy fund stands somewhere around $260,000. Um, I'm going to go try as briefly as I can, but the new, the new language allows for 100% of capital improvements to this church above the, the co where the cost comes in above 5% of the annual budget. At this point, that stands at around $12,000. So if the council was to in want to do a capital improvement and it came in over $12,000 total, um, the money that would go be from, through the council to the endowment committee and they would 
be able to appropriate the 100% of the cost of that. Let's say a new roof for Luther Hall. I'm sure that would come in over 12,000 and they would just you know, be able to take money from the fund and pay for that. They also have a um, section that's called smaller capital improvements and that's anything that ranges between a $3,000 cost and this about $12,000 cost. Um, the, the proposal is to use a 50-50 on some of this, um, be able to, that for the congregation to be able to raise funds and there will be a matching fund through the, the legacy fund and through um, endowment committee. They also have a provision for mission and outreach. And right now we don't have anything in our endowment. I know we have youth and education in there, but we have this kind of missing gap when it comes to outreach and mission. So mission and outreach projects also will go through council to the endowment and the funds will be available through the legacy. Um, the trustees of the endowment fund will then be able to expend money from this 250-ish where we are now to a floor of 150,000. At that point, the recommendation and the language is that they will um, they will start um, cutting back because in order to continue the fund to be viable, it needs to rebuild at that point. Um, they will be able to expend 75% of the annual growth and then the other 25% will be reinvested into the fund so that it builds back up to around this $250,000 ceiling. Um, the donations can be made at any time to the fund. We're thinking possibly um, through you know, planning, you know, financial planning. I mean, there's lots of ways to keep this fund building and growing and being a living legacy for our congregation. Um, I personally think thank the, the council they have done amazing work and our congregation has been so interested if you do again if you do want a copy they a paper copy they are found at the back and I have a couple also thank you And just think, in two weeks we actually get to explain, the, or three weeks, we actually get to explain the legal language of it. So just hold on, y'all. It's going to be an amazing time. Um, but as you said, it's an incredibly important matter, um, and it's not one that the council has taken upon lightly. Um, the reality of it is, um, I think we would all much rather just kind of fly by the seat of our pants, but the state of Ohio says absolutely positively not when it comes to things like this. So we have to sit together and muddle through um, the highs and the lows in the language and, and wrestle with it. So, um, again, huge thanks to Nancy for the work she's done, Council for the work they've done, um, and the work that the Endowment Committee did in preparing stuff for us. Any other announcements? If not, let us hear now God's Word. Our first reading comes from Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 6. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah and those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Be we will read Psalm 72 responsively. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. And the mountains may bring prosperity to the people, and the hills in righteousness. Let 
May he live as long as the sun and moon endure, from generation, one generation to another. In his time, may the righteous flourish, and let there be an abundance of peace, till the moon shall be no more. May all kings bow down before him, and all the nations do him service. He has compassion on the lowly and poor, and preserves the lives of the needy. Our second reading is from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. For surely you have already heard of the commission of God's grace that was given me for you, and how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I wrote above in a few words a reading of which will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, this mystery was not made known to humankind, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of his power. Although I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he has carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have access to God in boldness and confidence through faith in him. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the second chapter. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened in all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. The Gospel of our Lord. Congregation may be seated. Any of our young folks that wish to come forward at this time can do so. Good 
morning, y'all. How we doing? Doing good? What's up, Drew? How you doing? So, you know, there are those times that we feel that, well, maybe we're just not all that important. We feel that maybe we're too small and bigger people get to do different things or, or maybe that we're just not doing something that we want to do and all of our friends are doing and we feel like maybe we're just not quite as, as important as we think we are or that we want to be or that maybe we should be. Today in our second lesson we hear this wonderful letter from Paul and he talks about being least among the saints but to him has been trusted this amazing message of the gospel. That Jesus isn't just for the Jewish people, but he's for all of the world, for all of the Gentiles. And that this least of these servants, he wasn't even one of the original 12. Paul came along much after. But he has this incredibly important message to tell to the church. You know, I know there are some times around here that we do things and to be young, you don't feel like you much belong. We vote on things. We do things. We go out and we do a project. And maybe as one of our young folks, you don't feel like, well, I don't contribute much. I need to tell you something. Y'all do amazing things. Not just for us in this place, but for everybody. $2,500 you all raised by pulling wagons and carrying buckets up and forth down the aisle. Folks gave because they've got a heart for what we're doing. But they also did it because of you all and your joy. It was your idea. It's your project. And you help us live out our ministry. You know what? We've thanked them a few times for the stuff they do. We have people stand up on Memorial Day and we thank them. And we have them stand up on Veterans Day and we thank them. But today, I want to do something that I don't think we do often enough. To you all, thank you. Sometimes we grown-ups get stuck in our ways and we don't see the big stuff around us. I want to thank you for during Christmas. I want to thank you for during Advent helping us color and for you showing us Jesus. Because sometimes without you, we miss it. Thank you guys for the ministry you do and the gospel you share. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, you have blessed us with the gifts of young hearts and minds and spirits to surround us and remind us that you were born a child. Help us, Lord, to follow where they lead and to be open to learn from the joy of their serving. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks you all for coming up. You can head back and we will sing our hymn of the day.
I know everybody got up this morning, got themselves around, got ready to come to church, and said, man, we are so excited that we are going to get a lesson in history and politics today from Pastor. Did that know what you all thought when you woke up? Well, that's how we're going to start. A little bit of history and politics. First off, one of the things the Bible does is it kind of skews timelines for those of us who are reading some 2,000 years later. And so we paint these pictures and we do these things that, that probably are a little bit out of skew on the timeline. Now, if we start looking and pulling out things, chances are the three guys gathered around the manger today probably never saw the manger. The reality is they probably went to the house, as Matthew says, where, where Jesus, Mary, and Joseph would have lived. Probably wasn't on the day, because I know it's sometimes hard for us to think about the way it was, but what ha did not happen was they did not wake up, they did not email or text one another and say, my Uber will pick you up, we will get to the airport, we'll fly to Jerusalem, make our way to Bethlehem. And so probably the journey took them a little longer than what Matthew makes it appear to us. So the reality is probably they showed up someplace within about a two-year window. Now how do we know it was about a two-year window? Because we know that one of the things Herod did when these three guys decided that they, they weren't going to go back and tell him all they had found out about this child, was Herod decided to have every child under the age of two executed. We know this because we know that Mary and Joseph and Jesus fled into Egypt and then came back after this great killing of the innocents. Herod decided to wipe everybody out who was against him. Everyone who may rise up to be king. It's how you did things back in those days. You know, if you read any bit of European history, you understand that that's how kings behaved. They destroyed anybody who could be a challenge to their throne. And that's what Herod did. So chances are, the three guys who show up were there for some time within about a 24-month window. Second thing is, we sing a hymn about them that is completely wrong. The hymn we sing is, We Three Kings. Chances are, they weren't kings. Because kings were, were kind of too busy ruling their own kingdoms to be going out traipsing all over the, the world, taking a two-year journey to go find somebody else to pay homage to. They were magi. They would have been members of the king's court. They would have been advisors. Probably the equivalent would be to us today, something we might understand would be prime minister or secretary of state. They'd have been somebody sent out to do the bidding of the king. Now, one of the things that we need to understand from the political standpoint is that one of the things that an ambassador has to do, if you remember back to the Cold War days, those of us who are old enough to remember the Cold War days, there'd be high-level dialogues going on between the Russian ambassador and whoever was, was in the White House of the administration. And you would always hear those wonderful scenes or see those wonderful scenes in movies where that, that Russian diplomat dressed in that suit would look and go, I have to call the Kremlin. Because he couldn't speak without getting approval from the Kremlin because you dare not speak something that wasn't actually what your rulers once were. So these wise men travel from afar this great huge distance to come and pay homage to this child representing their king. So what's important about that for us? First off, I think Matthew says it well, they searched diligently. They did their history. They read their Old Testament scriptures. Why is that important to us? Because they weren't Jewish. They were Gentiles, like you and me, and yet they went to find this child that they had heard so much about, and they followed this incredible star that stayed in the sky. They came bringing these gifts that we know later was a foreshadowing of Jesus' death. Gold and frankincense and myrrh to buy the tomb, to prepare the body. We know that the gifts sound amazing to us, but really what they were were gifts showing everyone that he would not die at a ripe old age. The idea that these magi took the time to travel so far to bring gifts to the child, 
who knelt in homage to him is they were able to recognize what Jesus' own people struggled to recognize. They recognized him as king of king and lord of lords. Even Paul, at the time of Jesus' life, didn't recognize Jesus as that. Paul, at the time of the apostles in the beginning, did not recognize Jesus as that because Paul himself set out to persecute the church and destroy the message of Jesus because the message of Jesus was frustrating and contrary and contradictory to how most people live their lives. Believe me, the chief priests and scribes inside the temple would have lifted Jesus up on high and wanted him to be that true king that people expected if the ways that he taught fit in with what was normal in the world. The people in Jerusalem, as Jesus makes his triumphal entry during that most holy of weeks, would have raised, rise, risen, risen up, and there we go, risen up in revolution if they had truly seen this message of Christ as being the true hope of the world. You see, most folks didn't see that because Jesus made people uncomfortable. He hung out with the people that others didn't want to hang out with. He healed people on the Sabbath day. He touched lepers. Now, I don't know if you know about leprosy, but it's incredibly contagious and you touch people and parts of your body start to fall off and rot away. It's not a good disease. And yet Jesus touched them and healed them. Those who were unclean, they had their own colonies outside of town so that people wouldn't be infected. And Jesus touched them. Jesus hung out with women and that was a definite no-no in Jesus' day. His disciples picked grain on the Sabbath. And Jesus threatened the rule of everyone. Because let's be really honest. The idea of putting yourself out there for the poor and destitute make us all a little uncomfortable. Who here, like me, has driven into a town and seen somebody standing next to a red light knowing they're going to walk up to your car and ask for money and you put your windows up and turn your radio up. I'm guilty. I've done it. Who here walking through a town has, have looked at someone when they've said, can you spare a buck? No, I don't have any change on me right now. I've done it. Nothing's changed in the 2,000 years since Jesus was born. Jesus was the one who went to those people, not away from them. The reality is, Jesus goes into those places that are most uncomfortable. He goes into those places and deals with the people that are the most untouchable. He goes into those places and he loves the folks that are the most unlovable. And that makes everybody uncomfortable. Including many times the church today. But yet, these three wise magi follow this star to come to the place of this child who is truly not born into royalty, not born into prestige, not born into power. And they kneel down and acknowledge him as King of King and Lord of Lords. And it changes them. Because here's the other part of history that we probably don't want to think about. Herod had the full might and power of the Roman army. Think about that for a minute. Think about knowing your history and understanding the power and might of the Roman legions in the day of Jesus. Nobody messed with Rome. They had legions. 
We make movies about them. They are held up as heroes and warriors. We still use Roman numerals to, to look at our military units. The reason is because they were the best of the best. And here these wise men come. And they go to this manger, to this lowborn son of a carpenter, and they kneel in front of him and they honor him as king. This child has no power. He has no army. He has no might. He has no ability to retaliate. Truth be told, this child would have had no clue that these representatives of kings would have come to him to honor him. I don't remember much of what happened in my first two years of life except for the story that my mother told me of being dropped on my head. I remember that story, but I do not remember being dropped on my head. Stop. It doesn't explain everything. But the reality is, is that Herod had the power to retaliate against the nations of these wise men. He had the full might and force of the Roman army to retaliate against them for snubbing him. And yet these three, these three wise men who followed the star said, we're not going back to him. We know that we are now snubbing the true king of the Roman Empire. But it's worth the risk. It's worth the risk to our lives. It's worth the risk to our nations. It's worth the risk to our people. Because the other thing that was different in those days, one of those wise men, one of those courtiers of a king, go back to their king and tell them the story and said, so did you go back to Herod like he asked you to? And they would have looked and said, no, my liege. It was very possible. At that very moment, they would be headed and their entire family with them because that's the way history worked. And yet these three wise men saw in this child the promise of all promises, the hope of all hope, the true light that shines in the darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. They saw in this child, in Jesus, promise of hope, the promise of grace, the promise of salvation. So for you and I, Gentiles, who travel to the place of the Christ child and offer ourselves up to give to him all that we are and to receive that grace and love and mercy in return. May our lives be as changed as theirs. May our worlds be as revolutionized as theirs. May our way of seeing others be as loving as theirs. May we live our faith with the promise of grace, with the promise of mercy, the promise of hope with the truth of salvation. May this child that we come forward to receive totally in his body, in his blood, change our lives forever. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, you call us to you to be renewed, refreshed, and to be sent out. Help us, Lord, to see others as you see us. Broken, yet redeemable. Sinful, and yet forgiven. Poor, and yet rich. May we share your love. May we reflect your light. May we be your church. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand as we join together in confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, 
creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered, uh, Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, forgiveness of sins, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last. Amen. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. And also with you. Please greet one another with the sign of Christ's love and peace. Peace. return to our Lord what he's first given us, our gifts of tithe and offering. Tell it on the mountain Go tell it in the valleys That my Jesus My blessed Jesus Christ is born Jesus is born 
tell it on the mountain. Go tell it on the mountain. On the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Most gracious God, you are the light of the world. We pray that you continue to shine your light in the darkness and that the darkness will not overcome it. Bless your church. May she be a beacon of your light and hope in the world. Stir our hearts as we reach out with love and grace 
Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Almighty God, your light never goes away. Continue to shine your light into the world, that the world may see love and hope, the world may see promise and grace, the world may seek justice and truth. Be with world leaders and all who govern. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Almighty God, may your light shine into our hearts. Renew our spirits and lives, forgive us our sins, and send us forth into the world proclaiming your great joy. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Almighty God, your light never fails. Shine your light upon the sick, the destitute, and those who are ill in body, in mind, or in spirit, those who grieve and are grieving, and for those upon whom death draws near. Give strength, grace, hope, and healing of heart, of mind, and of soul to all of those named in our bulletin and those written on our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, you have willed that we would one day turn our swords into plowshares. Help us, Lord, to be seekers and bringers of peace within our lives, within our communities, within our world, seeking justice and truth and promise. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Almighty God, you are the rest of the blessed dead and the hope of the feast to come. We pray that you be with all who grieve in this season, with all who suffer and struggle. Give them hope, give them promise, surround them with your love, and yet let your holy angels watch over them, that the evil one have no power. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. In your hands, almighty God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <laughs> The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord. Sharing our life, he lived among us to reveal your glory and love, that our darkness should give way to his own brilliant light. And so with your church on earth and all the host of heaven, we praise your name and join the unending hymn. 